Okay, how's that mean? And I'm going to let you into a secret. I'm not supposed to be preaching this morning. Unfortunately, David is not very well. Um, so this is done on very short notice. <laughs> sometimes they're the best ones, sometimes they're not, but hey. Jesus is the head of the church. We know that from Scripture. We know that from ourselves. We know that he is the head. Yet, how often does this happen within the church? Don't let him in. It will change everything. Which side of that picture are you on? Are you with Jesus outside? Or are you on the inside, afraid of what he's going to do? Jesus is the head of the church. We heard that in the letter from Paul today. If we look at the, the verse in a slightly different way, I haven't got a slide for this, but just bear with me, we can actually see it's sort of a poem. Jesus Christ, he says, is the firstborn. The first meaning, which comes twice in verses 15 and in verse 18. Jesus Christ is supreme, which has been here as a head to hint at the same point. Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. Jesus Christ is the beginning. If we are not worshipping Jesus Christ, friends, we are doing something terribly, terribly wrong. But to worship Jesus Christ... We have to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us to allow us to call him Lord. We know that from Scripture. And we know that by worshipping Jesus, we are seeing the Father through him. We are seeing the Trinity. Paul writes in this way to assert that Jesus is the head of the church. Paul is writing this from prison, yet he is still declaring that Jesus is supreme. Indeed, the title that our, our English translations put in this is the supremacy of the Son of God. So how good are we at following Jesus? How good are we at following where he calls us to? How good are we? at changing the things that we need to change within ourselves, that Jesus is saying, you need to change that. Or do we put up barriers? Perhaps we could say, change the picture of the church to ourselves. Have you built a wall between you and Jesus because you're afraid of going to those places that he wants to take you? Indeed, you know my story. I'm sure I've shared this many times before. But when... I was exploring ordination. I said to Jesus, well, I'm happy to do all that you want me to do, but I like my career in law, so I'm going to stay there. It was only when I gave up that career that Jesus was able to work. And indeed, my DDO said to me afterwards, if you'd have never left law, Tim, you wouldn't have been going to a selection conference. I had to give my all to Jesus. Are you willing to give your all to Jesus? Are you willing, as that word that came to us when we were praying, to be fully connected in so that you can do good for the kingdom? Or are you quite happy coming to church, singing a few songs, hearing somebody speak from the front, and then going away again and getting on with life? Which one are you, friends? I hope that you're like this. That your Christianity does not prevent you from being Christ-like. Quite a powerful statement. But I wonder, how often has Christianity got in the way of us being Christ-like? Indeed, how often has the church got in the way of us being Christ-like? It's become a man-made institution with all the man-made rules that says you can and cannot do this. I hope and pray that we never get too sucked in to all of that legislation that we become legalistic and pharisaical and that actually we remain focused on Jesus Christ. That might mean we have to change. 
like that picture at the start. We might have to change to become more like Jesus. That's not necessarily going to be easy. We know that when Jesus calls us to do things, he will equip us to do what we are called to do. But we know that it's not always an easy path. Indeed, when we read Scripture, we see all the biblical characters. It's not usually an easy path to do the Lord's work. It is this difficult, narrow path that we follow. But we have to follow it because our Lord and our Savior says, Come, follow me. That was the call to the disciples. Come, follow me. That is the call that Jesus is giving to each one of us here today. He is saying, come, follow me. Are we willing to go all in for Jesus? Would we do like the disciples did when they leave their father in the boat? James and John, isn't it? They leave their father in the boat and leave everything and follow Jesus. In some ways, I, I sort of liken myself to Matthew in many ways because I was in a career that would have paid very, very well. I was after the money. I was trying to get the most money out of, uh, of people for my clients. Or if I was defending, I'd try and get the least money out of them. And sometimes it was really hard even to get them to pay over a little bit. But I left all that behind because that's what God wanted me to do. So I want to ask you, friends, this morning, what is God asking of you at the moment? Where is God asking you to go in your life? Where have you been putting it off because you're afraid of going there? Song Oceans come to mind. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters in the presence of my Savior. Are we going to follow the call of Jesus? But it's not just following the call of Jesus that's important. Following the call of Jesus when it's what Jesus is asking us to do. It is hard to hear God's voice when you've already decided what God wants you to say. How are you you sitting there today? This isn't to make anyone feel guilty. Are you sitting there today knowing that God is asking you to do something? Or are you sitting there thinking, well, I need to do this, and I think that's what God's saying to me? Have you made up your mind already? Because guess what? God wants to change your mind. And he wants to send you to places where he is calling you to. That might be places you never dreamt of. Again, you know my story. Amanda and I never dreamt of ending up in Luton. I said to God, I'm not going any further south than Sheffield. And yet here we are in Luton, loving it. We go to places where we are called, even if that means leaving behind family, friends, support networks. Even if it means going places which we don't normally go to. Even if it means talking to people we don't normally talk to. Are you willing to do that for Jesus? Because if we are willing to do that... That's when we will start to see the nation changed. Because we will be bringing more of Jesus Christ into society which so desperately, desperately needs it. Indeed, we look at society and think, what's gone wrong? We used to be a Christian country. Secularism is getting in the way. Secularism is getting in the way of the church. The time, friends, I believe, is for us to rise up as the army of God. To follow Jesus Christ to where he wants us to be. And to make a difference in this nation. Are you up for it? It's a bit muted response really, isn't it? I thought you might be up for that. Are you up for it? Are we going to be an army of believers rising up out of these four walls and taking Jesus into the nation? I believe that's what the Holy Spirit is asking us to do. I believe that is why we are spending the time studying the Scriptures, going back to basics. I absolutely loved what Helen said this morning. If you've opened your Bible recently, well done. It's not about that. It's not about an academic exercise reading the Bible in the year. It's there as a tool to support you, to help you get into that regular pattern, that disciplined pattern of studying the Scriptures. If you don't spend time with the Scriptures, how do you know Jesus Christ? If you don't know 
If you don't spend time with your loved ones, how do you know them? Do you drift apart? It's exactly the same with our relationship with Jesus. He is our brother. He is our friend. He is our savior. So, what is the Lord asking you to do? The more that we look at Jesus, the more we see the Father. Do we know the Father? How well do you know the Father in heaven? Is it hard to relate to him because of your earthly father? Look at Jesus. If you struggle to relate to God, look at Jesus. If you struggle to work out what the Holy Spirit's doing, look to Jesus. We have to know all three parts of the Trinity for our faith to work. The Holy Spirit dwells within each of us, whether we know it or not. But if you say Jesus is Lord, you know the Holy Spirit is with you. You know that that will help you look to God the Father. Jesus is the supreme authority. He is the head of the church. In many ways, I think we need to get rid of all the hierarchy in the church. Because it gets in the way of allowing Jesus to do what he wants to do in his church. Yes, I did just say that. Yes, this will be on YouTube. And it is recorded and it will be public. But we've got too many man-made structures in the church. There are too many people in the higher places of the church and not enough people on the ground supporting the mission of Jesus Christ and getting involved in the Missio Dei, the mission of God in this land. Now, yes, I know we, we need bishops. It's in the Bible. It's in the Episcopoi. But why so many? Why all of these things that are taking so much money away from mission and getting out into society and being the good news, being the hands and feet of Jesus? A few years back, we sang that song at Thy Kingdom Come, Transform, Revive, and Heal Society. If we're asking Jesus to transform, revive, and heal society, he is saying right back to us, well, what are you doing about it? How are we going to transform, reveal, reveal, revive, and heal society? We each have a part to play in this, friends. We each have a part to play in bringing about a change in society. Because we need to introduce people to Jesus. Because if we don't introduce people to Jesus, who will? Who will? We represent Jesus in every sphere of our, in, of our lives. I represent Jesus as a vicar here at Christ Church. You represent Jesus in your workplace. You represent Jesus in your home. You represent Jesus in your family. And each and every single one of those, and many that I've missed, is all a calling from God. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. We need to scrap the idea of calling being to ordain ministry because every Christian has a vocation and every Christian has a calling. Indeed, the great John Stott said this. That's quite hard to read, isn't it? It's a wonderful privilege to be a missionary or a pastor. I'd agree with that. If God calls us. It's equally wonderful to be a Christian lawyer. That was hard for me. Industrialist, politician, manager, social worker, television scriptwriter, journalist, a homemaker. If God calls us to it, According to Romans 13, for an official of the state, whether legislator, magistrate, or police officer, is just as much a minister of God as a pastor. It is the hierarchy we have to reject, the pyramid that we have to demolish. That was in the contemporary Christian. It is a privilege to do what we do for Jesus when God calls us to it. If God isn't calling us to it, it's going to be difficult. We're going to face barriers. We're going to find that we can't go on. But if God calls us to it, he's going to open the doors and allow us to step out and do what he is asking us of us. What is God calling you to? What is Jesus asking of you in 2024? Are you going to make him the supreme authority in your life? Or are you going to have him as an afterthought?
Jesus, in many ways, is a blueprint for the genuine humanness which is on offer. He is the head of the body. He is the first to rise again from the dead. He is the one whose cruel death God dealt with our sins and brought us peace and reconciliation and begun the new creation. When we come in a few moments to celebrate Holy Communion, remember what Jesus did for you. It wasn't an academic exercise. He didn't do it just because he felt like it. He did it because he was called to do it. He was called to go to the cross, to take on our sin, to die for us, to tear that curtain in two, to give us access to the Father. Too often at Easter, I think we skip over all of the stuff that happens and we think, yeah, we know this story all too well. But as we start to look towards Lent, we turn our eyes from the crib to the cross. Let's have a think about what it truly means that we now have access to the Father. When Jesus cried out, it is finished. He truly meant it is finished. Jesus will show us the way. Jesus will show us what to do if we are willing to listen, if we are willing to change. What does that mean for us in the 21st century? That's a question for you to answer. That's a question for you to ask Jesus what he wants from you in the here and the now. That might mean a change in direction to where you thought you were going, but go with it. It's scary. It's terrifying. But it is an adventure of a lifetime. What is Jesus asking of you today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to make you the supreme authority of our lives. The supreme authority of the church. We want to put you back at the head of the church where you belong. Forgive us for the times when we've tried to do our own thing that's led to death and destruction. Father, we want to surrender ourselves to you once again. We don't want to be like that church that doesn't want to let Jesus in. Jesus, you are welcome here to do what only you can do. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome in our hearts. You are welcome in our lives. Lead us to places where our trust is without borders. To places that we never imagined going. Because you are with us. Now and always. Amen.